Welcome to Israel Now News. I'm Yochanan El Rome. And I'm Rebecca Rand. In our top story, the Czech Republic may soon relocate its embassy to Jerusalem. Members of the Czech government have agreed to take further steps to affirm the country's presence in the Israeli capital. In 2018, Prague established a Czech house in the Holy City, which contains a cultural center, trade offices, and meeting rooms for use by the Czech ambassador. This was seen at the time as a first step toward relocating the country's diplomatic mission to the Israeli capital. A spokesman for President Milo Zeman said Prague has agreed to move forward with plans to transfer its embassy from Tel Aviv, further strengthening its presence in Jerusalem and elevating it to the diplomatic level. The United States ambassador to Israel is warning that a Biden victory would be detrimental to Israel. David Friedman told a news outlet based in the United Arab Emirates that Iran is the most consequential issue of the upcoming election. He noted that Democratic candidate Joe Biden was part of the Obama administration that negotiated and implemented the Iranian nuclear agreement, known more commonly as the worst deal in history. The JCPOA allowed Iran a path to create a nuclear weapon, and if Biden were to become president, there is a possibility that the new administration would undermine all of President Trump's hard work at stopping Tehran's rogue nuclear program. Friedman also raised concerns over Biden's Middle East policy, which would surely cause a major setback of normalizing relations between Israel and Arab states, which is rapidly progressing under President Trump. The Israeli Defense Forces have analyzed video footage of a Hezbollah factory and identified machinery for assembling precision-guided munitions. Jerusalem has repeatedly raised concerns over the terror group's program to convert its enormous missile arsenal into laser-guided rockets, which would pose a serious threat to the Jewish state. Recently, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu exposed a covert missile factory used by the Shiite militia in the heart of a civilian neighborhood in Beirut. The IDF released screenshots of video footage identifying equipment in the building used to manufacture the precision-guided weapons. The IDF also identified the supposed civilian manager of the site as a Hezbollah operative who worked closely with Iranian forces on the terror group's advanced missile program. The Palestinian Authority is keeping with the tradition of saying one thing in English and quite another in Arabic. Recently, PA leader Mahmoud Abbas sent well wishes to President Trump for a speedy recovery from coronavirus, while the PA's official newspaper printed conspiracy theories that the president's diagnosis was fabricated. The article accused President Trump of faking it to win sympathy and to avoid future debates with his Democratic opponent, Joe Biden. Palestinian Media Watch, an Arabic-language watchdog organization, translated the article and reported that it went on to repeatedly insult U.S. President Donald Trump. After years of inciting and funding Palestinian terror in the holy city, Ankara has announced that Jerusalem belongs to Turkey. During his speech at the opening of the Turkish parliament's legislative session, President Recep Tayyip Erdogan said, Turkey is the successor state of the Ottoman Empire, which was forced from Jerusalem during the First World War. He told his fellow lawmakers that Jerusalem is our city. The Turkish leader falsely claimed that Palestinians had been in Jerusalem for thousands of years and that Israel had merely occupied the land, violating the rights of the Palestinians. However, Jerusalem, and specifically the Temple Mount, is the holiest site in Judaism. Jews have been connected to this place from the time of King David more than 3,000 years ago. And Jerusalem is the capital of the Jewish state of Israel. French President Emmanuel Macron has vowed to fight Islamic extremism in his country and has unveiled his plan to eliminate radicalism in Muslim schools and mosques. France has one of the largest Muslim populations in Europe and has become a hotspot of Islamic terror and merciless attacks against Jews. In a statement, Macron spoke of stricter oversight of foreign funding of mosques, of defending France's secular values against radical Islam, and he said that Paris plans to halt the trend of Islamist separatism that flouts French rules while enforcing Islamic Sharia law. Good news on the medical front. Five patients seriously ill with coronavirus have recovered after receiving an experimental Israeli treatment. In Livex Therapeutics, an Israeli immunotherapy company, 
held a clinical trial for its allocetra treatment at Jerusalem's Ain Karim Hospital. The protocol was administered to severe and critically ill patients suffering from COVID-19. All five of the patients treated were released from the hospital five to eight days after receiving the therapy and all tested negative for coronavirus when they were released. An American Jewish scientist and two of his colleagues have been awarded the Nobel Prize for their discovery of the hepatitis C virus. The Nobel Committee said the discoveries of Harvey J. Alter, Charles M. Rice, and Michael Houghton allowed the rapid development of antiviral drugs directed at hepatitis C. The disease is now curable, raising hopes of eradicating the virus from the world population. The Feast of Tabernacles concluded last week with the celebration of Hoshana Rabbah, where Jews bid farewell to the Sukkah. The following day, Israelis celebrated the culmination of the High Holy Days with Shemini Atzeret and Simchat Torah. This special holiday is a celebration of receiving the five books of Moses at Mount Sinai. It is traditionally marked by dancing with the Torah scrolls and studying the Hebrew Bible all night long. Jews read the final passages of Deuteronomy, then roll the scrolls back and immediately read the first passages of Genesis. This act is meant to signify the eternal nature of the Torah. The priestly blessings were recited at the Western Wall last week while Jews celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles. This special prayer is said twice each year during the pilgrimage holidays of Passover and Sukkot. The Sukkot prayers are especially alluring because they are recited while the Kohanim take up the four species. Birkata Kohanim usually draws massive crowds where several thousand Israelis and Jewish visitors from around the world flood the Kotel Plaza to hear the priestly blessings. However, due to restrictions to prevent the further spread of the coronavirus, the blessings were recited for an extremely limited crowd. But thanks to live streaming, audiences around the world were able to observe the ritual. Both chief rabbis, the American ambassador to Israel, and the mayor of Jerusalem said a special prayer of healing for U.S. President Donald Trump. The nation of Israel joins in praying for the president and first lady's swift recovery from the coronavirus. We are living in mysterious yet miraculous times. We've witnessed the most remarkable fulfillment of biblical prophecy, the Jewish people's return to Israel, and the prosperity and contributions of this tiny country in such a short time. Yet we've also seen an unexpected rise in anti-Semitism, which takes the form of anti-Zionism, and alliances between groups that are fighting against the most fundamental biblical values. In the book, Titus, Trump, and the Triumph of Israel, Josh Reinstein answers important questions to clarify what has driven political action from the time that the Roman Emperor Titus destroyed Jerusalem until today, when President Trump recognized Jerusalem as Israel's capital. Get your copy today and learn how faith-based diplomacy has changed the world. To order your advanced copy, go to triumphofisrael.com. That concludes the news portion of our show. Please stay tuned for Ask the Source with Josh Reinstein. Hello and welcome to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein, and we're here in our beautiful studio in Jerusalem. My guest today is member of Knesset, Michal Kotler Wunsch. Michal, thank you for being on the show. Thank you, Josh, for having me. Well, you just became a member of Knesset. You're one of the newest ones from the Blue and White Party. How's that been for you? It's been a huge, uh, demanding task of responsibility. Uh, we entered this government in a storm in the middle of, as we all know, a pandemic, which has affected the entire world, Israel as well, caught, off, caught us all off guard and has represented maybe one of the most challenging times economically in terms of health and also in terms of the social fabric of Israeli society. Politics should be no uh, new thing for you. You come from a, a, a long line of, of people who have been involved politically. Your father, a famed jurist, former minister of justice in Canada, one of Israel's dearest supporters, Oren Kotler. W what does it mean to, to continue that legacy? Um, so I spoke about it a little bit in my maiden speech in the Knesset just a few weeks ago, and I have to say 
it was really emotional. It was really emotional because I think that my political identity and my legal identity were really formed from a very young age around human rights causes, which my father championed, and around the understanding that the political arena is a place where we can affect change in the most beneficial way for all, including for human rights causes. And so uh, I, I think that it, it's a very important legacy, and I think that I bring with it many, many tools that I've learned over time that were inculcated into me as values as a young child, and of course, over adulthood, you know, have been able to be um, maybe, I'd say, projected outwards in terms of additional tools, both as a legal scholar, um, but really that responsibility for each and every individual that, as you say, my father represents so deeply. Yeah, I mentioned you're the one of the newest members of Knesset, but you're also one of the busiest and most active. Uh, how have you been able to take on so many different issues and really put some force behind it? I think that what's led me so far is the acknowledgement that in order to really benefit the entire citizenship of the state of Israel, the entire Israeli public, we need to move away from represent, rep representational um, politics, which the state of Israel has a little bit of, um, and some of the parties have more than the others. Uh, I represent, I'm, I, I have met many, many identities within me, and I represent each of those identities in different ways, and I'm committed to each of those identities in different ways. So if I say human rights as something that cuts across all my issues, women's rights, children's rights, I'm the chairperson for the Committee on uh, Drug and alcohol abuse uh, in the Knesset. And again, that transcends political divide. It pertains to every single, in many cases, child, woman, adult um, of the state of Israel. And it really uh, transcends beyond anything that divides us. So the focus on all that unites us comes with tremendous responsibility, as I mentioned. It's also what brought me to the Knesset. It's the acknowledgement of that tremendous responsibility and that it's the place that we can affect change most effectively. Uh, and that commitment, as I say to my team all the time, every day in Knesset, is we should treat it really as a mission. Uh, and we've been, giving, been given the right and the responsibility that comes with that mission to fulfill with courage and with humility for the sake of all of Israel's citizens and also for the connection of the state of Israel with our brothers and our sisters abroad. A very, very important thing to me in terms of Israel's connection to the outside world, to everybody that may be seeing us now Jewish communities, Christian communities, Muslim communities, I think that the State of Israel has a very important message and that we have to deliver it. One of the big messages that you brought up that I think people are starting to take a different look at is the double standard. Uh, Israel is judged on a different level than any other country around here. Can you talk about that? Absolutely. Um, so I think it's really a line that runs through, again, with re if, I, if my previous response, I, I related to things that really cut across all of the issues that I tackle and that I've done and that I bring with me into Knesset. The issue of double standard is one that we have to become very, very aware of. And actually, I think we have a shared responsibility in exposing it because when we attribute different, um, whether it's the implementation of law or different standards, when there is a double standard unexposed or unchecked without accountability or responsibility, it really undermines whatever it is that we set out to do, whether it's a law, whether it's human rights. And in this case, with regard to anti-Semitism, really the way that it came about, and we held two Knesset hearings, um, which I convened in the Immigration and Integration Committee at the Knesset, um, we held them as a response to a Twitter blackout, which I joined, a 48-hour blackout. Uh, that was uh, th The expression they used was no safe space for Jew hate. Uh, as a result of two tweets, or a few tweets by Wiley, um, which some of your viewers may be familiar with, they were up there for quite a long time. Uh, and Twitter didn't respond as quickly as you would have thought. Uh, if you uh, understand that what was really the underlying uh, message in those tweets is pure anti-Semitism. And the discussion actually raised the imperative in order to tackle a problem, to first define it. My recommendation to the digital platforms, including Twitter, that attended the hearing was the definition that already exists. There is an IRA working definition for anti-Semitism, which over 30 countries have already adopted, and that is one way to define anti-Semitism. Well, let me ask you a question then. You, you went all over the world with this. I saw you on Fox News and the New York Post. Um, the person from Twitter said it flat out when the Ayatollahs in Iran call for the destruction of the state of Israel, which is the death of six million Jews, that's okay, uh, but other types of racism are not. So, so how did they justify that? So 
really you're 100 percent right josh that just made it very very clear and if you saw that that hearing then you could actually see a little bit of shock on my face when the twitter representative responded to a very clear question so genocide calling for genocide is okay but commenting on political situation in one country or another by a political leader is not okay and the response was that according to the current twitter policy it actually somehow is okay which herein lies the problem right and in order to define it again we need to understand what it is what it is what is anti-semitism that's where the discussion went i want to say something about that which i think pertains to all of us not just to anti-semitism certainly not just to israel or the calls for genocide on israel and it's a little bit to do with the imperative to expose double standards the politicization or personalization of any of these issues. And at that specific hearing, you're right, it was about two specific cases that was equated, one with you know, Khomeini calling for genocide, the other with Trump tweeting you know, regarding political issues in the United States. But it's not about Khomeini and it's not about Trump. It's actually about the double standard. And that's what needs to be exposed and addressed. As I said, the suggestion was for the adoption of the IRA definition, it's, it, the suggestion was for a very clear policy, transparent policy, which both the users can be exposed to, and the suggestion was, and I say this as a free speech expert and really a human rights advocate, free speech doesn't have to be implicated in this discussion Quite on the contrary, and at the very same time there was a hearing ongoing in the United States with regards to something a little bit different, but with regards to really the power that digital platforms hold in their hand today and the responsibility that comes with that power. So the ability to educate millions and billions of users of digital platforms doesn't necessarily mean that we erase what's being said. It could mean that we use it to educate. If we know that a specific tweet is, according to the IRA definition, anti-Semitism, then we have the ability today to educate millions and billions of users to what anti-Semitism looks like. But I think you're making a very important point. As long as you cannot equate anti-Semitism with anti-Zionism, then they always have a way to say this is okay anti-Semitism because it's anti-Zionism. So why is it important to, to really implement that definition? So the IRA working definition, and for those of that might be familiar with it, defines anti-Semitism including what's known as the three Ds. And I say this as Professor Erwin Kotler's daughter with pride. The three Ds include the demonization, the delegitimization, and the double standard against the state of Israel. And I think that that's also the benefit of, inc first of all, it must include the three Ds. When, when I say implement the IRA definition, it must include the three Ds in order to authentically represent what we're saying about what is the definition of anti-Semitism. But it's also the place for Israel or for anti-Semitism to be the canary in the mine shaft in that regard. So double standards against the state of Israel, if we enable that, then double standards, and we see what's happening in the rest of the world if we don't expose double standards, whether it's with regards to the terror regime in Iran or the regime in China. And it's not, and I separate it from the people of Iran or the people of China who themselves, or the people of Gaza, by the way, who themselves are held hostage by those same terror regimes and ignoring the double standard enables the continued culture of impunity. That is the responsibility we have as trustees of human rights, as, 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 as countries, as organizations, as institutions and individuals committed to human rights to expose the double standard. That's why it pertains to all of us. Michal, there are literally tens of millions of people watching this show. What message do you have for a viewing audience? I would say to all of our viewing audience that the coronavirus, if it's taught us anything alongside the challenge, is the opportunity to understand that what binds us together is far greater than what separates us, and that united and fighting together against what we recognize as what challenges all of us, we are that much more likely to succeed. And for that, really, I call to a message that says, we advance all initiatives, whether they be of peace, and recently we heard of such an initiative with the UAE, which is so important, and whether it be with any other following initiatives that will follow up as a result of that and, and, and enable us to move forward in the present, identifying the opportunities towards a better future of peace and prosperity. Thank you, Michal, for being on the show, and thank you for tuning in to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein. Now back to the studio. Up next, the return to Zion with Karen Hayasod.
Shalom and welcome to the Return to Zion with Karen Ayesod. I'm Sam Grunwerk, World Chairman of Karen Ayesod United Israel Appeal, the leading official fundraising organization for the State of Israel. Today, all God's people rejoice in Jerusalem, the undivided capital of Israel. God bless you from Jerusalem. Despite enduring thousands of years of danger and persecution, the Jewish people never lost the heartfelt dream of returning home to the eternal city of Jerusalem, to the land of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to King David's capital. Scattered across the four corners of the earth, Jerusalem continued to beat relentlessly in the heart of every Jew. Through the darkest of days, the dream remained to see Jeremiah's prophecy come to life. There is hope for your future. Your children will return to their borders. And 50 years ago, the impossible happened. Exiled, dispersed, and downtrodden for generations, the Jewish people finally returned to Jerusalem. Faced with the might of multiple Arab armies, Israel's soldiers plucked victory from the jaws of tragedy. Finally, Jews could walk in the footsteps of their biblical forefathers and touch the stones of the Western Wall once more. Five decades since then, Jerusalem has become a city transformed. From the rubble of war, a modern, high-tech metropolis has been built. A political capital and a cultural capital has blossomed. New neighborhoods continue to be built, while cutting-edge medical centers, universities, and research hubs lead the world. And all the time, a heavenly tranquility can be felt as the faithful of three religions worship, live, and play in freedom. Jews continue today to flock to Jerusalem to witness and live this modern-day miracle. They arrive from the four corners of the earth to experience a Jerusalem which their ancestors could not possibly have imagined. Soon, the Jews of Israel will outnumber those living in the rest of the world for the first time in two millennia. With the help of Karen Hayasad's supporters, they are making new lives in the land of Israel. The Jewish people are truly coming home. They are part of a thriving, dynamic city a city which stands at the crossroads of the past and the future, the ancient and the modern, where thousands of years of history blend seamlessly with the promise of a better, brighter tomorrow. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will lift up my hand to the nations and set up my standard to the peoples, and they will bring your sons in their bosom, and your daughters will be carried on their shoulders. To this day, Karen Hayasad is helping Jews around the world come home with the help of Jews and non-Jews alike. But the mission is not yet complete. Jerusalem continues to develop, to strive for greater prosperity. Ethiopian Jews continue to arrive, facing the difficult challenge of absorption. The possibilities for this special city, with this special community at its heart, are endless. And together, we can write the next chapter in a history like no other. Due to the coronavirus pandemic, we're expecting a massive wave of Aliyah from Jewish communities all around the world. Help us bring them home. Let's bless Israel together. To donate and get information, visit khisrael.org. The biblical prophecy is unfolding right before our very eyes. The people of Israel are returning to the Promised Land after 2,000 years of exile. But millions of Jews are still longing to come home. Bless Israel by supporting Karen Hayasod United Israel Appeal, the leading official fundraising organization for the State of Israel. Together, we can fulfill the prophecy of the Bible. Let's bless Israel together. To donate and get information, visit khisrael.org. Ladies and gentlemen, we must all stand up to Iran 
And President Trump deserves praise for doing exactly that. First and foremost, I commend President Trump for withdrawing from the flawed nuclear deal with Iran. In 2015, I stood alone among world leaders in opposing the shameful nuclear deal that was made with Iran. I opposed it because the nuclear deal did not block Iran's path to the bomb. It actually paved its way to it. I opposed it because the deal's restrictions on Iran's nuclear program were only temporary and were in no way tied to Iran's change of behavior. Now Iran has violated even those temporary restrictions. Because of these violations, Iran will have enough enriched uranium in a few months for two nuclear bombs. And Iran has been working on a new generation of centrifuges, it's called the IR-9, which will multiply Iran's enrichment capability 50-fold. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no question that Iran is seeking nuclear weapons. The one secret nuclear archive Israel's agents obtained from the heart of Tehran proves that beyond a shadow of a doubt. In the run-up to the nuclear deal, Israel was told, especially by our European friends, that any Iranian violation would be met with a quick and severe response. But in the face of Iran's brazen violations, in the face of the irrefutable evidence of the nuclear archive, the Security Council has done, well, absolutely nothing. And wedded to the failed nuclear deal, the Security Council also still refuses to see what was obvious to anyone who understands anything about the Middle East. Rather than curb Iran's aggression, the nuclear deal fed and funded it. Five years ago, in removing the sanctions on Iran, the leading powers of the world opened the door of a tiger's cage. And then they simply hoped for the best. But instead, exactly as I warned five years ago, we who live in the Middle East are suffering the consequences of that irresponsible deal. A richer and emboldened Iran used the billions that flowed into its coffers to fuel its campaign of carnage and conquest across the region. The biblical prophecy is unfolding right before our very eyes. The people of Israel are returning to the Promised Land after 2,000 years of exile. But millions of Jews are still longing to come home. Bless Israel by supporting Karen Hayasod United Israel Appeal, the leading official fundraising organization for the State of Israel. Together, we can fulfill the prophecy of the Bible. Let's bless Israel together. To donate and get information, visit khisrael.org. And that's all for this edition of Israel Now News. I'm Yochanan El Rome. And I'm Rebecca Rand, reporting from our studio in Jerusalem. Please join us next week for all of your Israel updates.